record, record. Hmm. Okay, so this is not working. Hang on. Okay, let me just stop the recording here. Yeah, sorry for experimenting on you. I'm going to. I lost my application window here. Yeah. Okay, so Philip, can you see what you were supposed to be seeing? Not sharing a window. Okay. Right. Okay, hang on. Sorry, all the experimenting on here. Okay. Right, I'm going to try again. Philip, can you see what you're supposed to be seeing? No. Hallelujah. Okay, but now the session is not being recorded, I think. Is the session being recorded? Is it being recorded? It is being recorded. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, let me just lower my volume. Okay, so sorry for those who watched the recording, so skip through the waffle. Let's then start. Let me just go into tablet mode again and check whether this, my screen is still sharing. I think that might have been the problem. Uh, can you still see the screen? Okay. Okay. So let's first discuss, we are going to start our discussion on semester test one, um, where I would like to show frequently made mistakes. The first question um, tests whether you understand the concept of the energy balance for adiabatic systems. You had three different options that you had to explore. So let's just, um, first option was a CSDR, Second option was a plug flow reactor, and the third option, two CSTRs in series. You were given inlet conditions, which were different for the different tests, but the same for each of the three scenarios. And you were given the outlet temperature of your reacting system. You had to limit that to a certain maximum temperature. And the question asked you to calculate the conversion Basically, what the questions asked was calculate the maximum possible conversion if this is your T max. Right. So, what you had to realize from this is if I now, so now, if I now add, draw my energy balance, so let's just draw our energy balance X versus temperature, and we add specific T naught values. So, if I now have my T naught at the inlet, that energy balance, because you could neglect the change, the uh, dial CP of the reaction, is a straight line. And whether I have a system, because it's adiabatic, so even for this, oh, that's a funky color. So even for this system over here, where I have this um, intermediate, this jump in temperature, even for that system, what you must should have realized is if I draw a black box, okay, this is a blue box, around any of these systems, I can do an energy balance from inlet to outlet, from inlet to outlet, from inlet to outlet, right? And it's that same straight line energy balance that applies. Therefore, the answer you get for a single CSDR for that X where your temperature is at a maximum, or the answer you get for your plug flow reactor, where that X crosses that T max, or that X, where this for your double CSTR system, where that achieves that maximum temperature. That is at the same overall conversion that is based on your inlet conditions to your reacting system. Okay, so that is the first thing that you had to realize in this test. Uh, it is independent of the size of your reactor independent just says you could have done this in ctd i could have asked this question in ctd i could have asked this question in sir two i could have asked you this question uh, what you had to realize is i have to 
analyze this overall system and the amount of energy that's released in here, regardless of how it's done, is not dissipated by any amount of heat flow. And therefore, the black box approach for the energy balance could apply. I can heat everything up to that maximum temperature if I should draw my H versus temperature diagram. So from my inlet temperature, pretend I'm heating everything up that comes in to my reactor from my inlet temperature to T max, and that was not an unknown, and then react, okay? And this must end at exactly the same position as the outlet because Q, which is equal to del H of my flowing streams, must be equal to zero. So the question here, this is epsilon times del H reaction. I actually ask you to calculate that epsilon. And that's independent of the, whether you are using a CSTR, two CSTRs, or a plug flow reactor. Okay. But first off, uh, to, I must interrupt myself here and say that I um, was very, I enjoyed marking your test significantly. Sorry, I just jumped into this discussion. I had so much fun marking your test this time. I never have fun marking tests, but I liked reading your code. Yes, your code was actually, most of you, you are coding like superstars, and I was very impressed by the progress you made in terms of your coding skills. I enjoyed marking your test. Most of you performed really well, especially when it comes to modeling plug flow reactors. I was really, this was a, a good experience for me. And so many of you actually made the discovery of the, for the plug flow reactor, and now I miss my erase everything button. Um, for the plug flow reactor, you can do that discovery by just modeling it and using an event function. So lots of people, when they modeled the PFR, used an event function to stop at that T is equal to T max, and then they discovered that that X is the same as the X max for the CSTR, and that was fine. But okay. So um, do we have questions? Right. Okay, so now um, what I want to... So that's for the first CSTR. Um, so you had to solve that X max first in that first CSTR. So let's just have that CSTR reactor. You had to solve that X first. So that was independent of the mole balance. And then the mole balance of the reactor is fixed because you know if, if I know that was given. I now know the FA out of my reactor. So I know that. I know the FA out. So in my mole balance, the only unknown minus FA, plus the rate times the volume must be equal to zero. This is now known. My rate I could calculate. The rate is equal to min K times CA times CB. There we go. And um, in terms of the rate, this is where lots of people lost marks. We are chemical engineers. That makes us what makes us different is that different is that we can do more balances and that we do understand reaction stoichiometry. So please, when it came to calculating that CB, some people were really confused. Lots of people actually were really confused in calculating that CB. So let's just go back to Sir one. Okay, so let's go back to Sir one. If you wanted, to, so now we are looking at this, right? C A C B, and I had to calculate my C B. I can calculate. Nobody had an issue with calculating C A because they know that F A is equal to F A naught times one minus that X max, and if I divide that by Q, I will have C A. But now to relate C B to that X, do not try to guess. Do not trust your intuition. And I discovered that in that first study where we had the um, autocatalytic reaction. Set up a stoichiometric table until you feel I can just see what is going to happen. Because many people said that this. They said FB is equal to FB naught plus FA naught times X. Okay, so B is going to increase. Right. Or um, People said FB is equal to well, lots of similar kinds of mistakes in terms of what is going to happen to this uh, um, calculation of FB. Set up a stoichiometric table where you just have your components, FI, so I have an FA, I have an FB, and I have an FC. And I have it at the inlet, and I have it at the 
outlet. And at the inlet, I had FA naught and I had FB naught. FB naught and FA naught in this case was exactly the same. And this FC naught was equal to naught, right? So now, how we fold this in, and I'm going to use your CTD now because this is still fresh in my memory to relate to what you have learned before. Stoichiometric number. What's the stoichiometric number? The reaction was A plus B that goes to C. For A, it is minus 1. For B, it is minus 1. And for C, it is plus 1. So what is the number of moles of each of the components that I will have at the end? It is whatever was present initially plus that stoichiometric number, which have a sign, times epsilon of, uh, epsilon of the reaction. Plus, so if I note, plus, let me just get my script notes here, epsilon of the reaction. Right, so it's moles per mole. So in this case, stoichiometric number times epsilon. So for A, it's going to be if I note minus epsilon. This is FB naught minus epsilon, and this is just going to be epsilon because FC naught is equal to zero. So this calculation is whatever was coming in plus stoichiometric number in that reaction times epsilon. All right, so it's a very long way. I know it's a very long way to go about it. But I thought I will just show it to you because I think about 40% of the class, no, 30% of the class got this wrong. Right, so now, how do I relate this to an X? And now I can just write my epsilon in terms of X of A. So if I know epsilon is equal to the del F of A divided by its stoichiometric number, the del F of A is F A minus uh, if, uh, if, if I, whatever comes out, minus if I naught divided by minus 1. And everyone realized this is if I naught times 1 minus x. Nobody had issues with that. Right. So if I now substituted that in there, I could see that my epsilon is equal to if I naught times x. Right. So now I can substitute that for fb. So fb is equal to f b naught minus epsilon and epsilon is f a naught times x and f c is whatever is f c it is f c naught which was naught plus epsilon which is f a naught times x right yes okay i can't hear you can you uh, can you speak in your microphone please apologies Sorry, Philip is in the clause, and I've got my earphones on. Yuri is asking a question whether the units of K was correct. He's, he asks whether it shouldn't have rather been liter squared per mole squared per second. Okay, let's look at the units, um, Yuri. Thank you. So if the units confused you, then uh, I am in the wrong. So let's just look at the units of my K. So what do I want my right to be? My right must be in moles per liter per second, right? Mole converted per liter per second, okay? So that needs to be a K, which are moles per liter for my two and moles per liter. So now I have K, which must have whatever units, moles squared, um, and I've got the liters squared. Okay. So if I want this in moles per liter per second, the units of K must be liter per mole per second. Am I correct? Yes. What units did I give in the test? That. Hallelujah. Okay. All right. Okay, Yuri, happiness? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. So this is how the I want this. This is liter is liter reactor. No, this is mole per liter. What's the liter of my reactor then that must give me those units? Okay, so um, questions about that. So I know this is baby steps. Uh, let me see if I get, can get a new page. Right. So if I now, the next complication is this one. So everybody that giving, getting the mole balances then correct for the PFR, most people had no issues with that. In the second reacting system, where I asked you to calculate the volumes, that must be equal. Still, what you had to realize, otherwise this question became very difficult, is that this X max 
must be the same as the x max in A and in C, right? So this was given. So I know my FA out, okay? I know the FA. I also know FB out because I can relate it to the stoichiometry. Therefore, I know the concentration in each of, in my second reactor. I know the concentration of A. I know the concentration of B. I also know that temperature max. So I know the temperature in my second reactor. So in the second reactor, I can calculate the rate before I start. The rate is a known variable. Right. Okay. But what is unknown is that, and what is also unknown is that inlet molar flow rate to that reactor. So in my mole balance for the second reactor, I have FI1, which is an unknown. I know the FI2, that is known. The volume is an unknown, and my rate is a known variable. So that volume is an unknown. For my first reactor, I know the inlet stuff, so I know if I naught. I do not know the if I one that comes out, so that is an unknown. Therefore, I do also do not know the rate because I don't know those concentrations. Okay, but I know the inlet temperature, and I can do an energy balance over that stream. So the unknown that I actually had to solve for, once I can solve for that FI1, so if I guess for different FI1 values, there were diff lots of different ways of solving this problems, problem. But if I guess this FI1 value, I am able to calculate for each guessed FI1 value, I'm able to calculate this volume. That volume, I've got an equation for the volume of reactor two, oh, sorry, reactor one, volume of reactor two is equal to the volume of reactor one. And subsequently, that for a gas value of FI1, I have the volume of two, I can calculate the volume of reactor um, one, okay? So this FI1 is then given, and I can check by calculating my rate whether this will in fact then give me zero. There are many other kinds of equations that you could set up to, um, to test for this, but in fact the only energy balance that you had to do was the energy balance over this first reactor. In order to calculate the rate of in the reactor one, so in the reactor one, I needed the temperature and I needed if I want. I'm guessing this value. So I'm guessing FI1. Once I've guessed FI1, given the inlet conditions, I can calculate temperature 1 using my energy balance, star 8, FI0, X, sum FI0, CPI. I can calculate the temperature. So I guess this, I can calculate that temperature. Once I have the temperature and FI1, if I, the FB one I can calculate, I therefore have the concentrations in this reactor. I have the concentrations and I have the temperature for each gas value of FI1. I can then calculate my rate and I can check this equation somehow. That can be the equation that I return from FSOL to see if this was the correct FI1. Okay, so if I want, you can write in terms of X1, of course, and that can be the variable that you guess, but this is the approach I followed to solve that problem. Okay, um, what I noticed, questions at this stage, let me just pause. Um, what I noticed was um, some confusion in terms of the energy balance. So fortunately, some of you attempted the energy balance for reactor two, which is not known. Uh, what you must realize, why is the energy balance not necessary? If I draw this, okay, I am still on the same straight line. So reactor one will end there, and reactor two will end there, because I do not interrupt that straight line by adding some heat transfer in between. I am still on that straight line. So the energy balance must match. You can go and test that is that the temperature I calculate here, and because these two molar flow rates are linked, okay, with this conversion over that reactor, it will, it will result, if you use this temperature one that you calculate from temperature, uh, from conversion over reactor one, it will result for the remaining conversion, if you then say how much energy is released over that reactor, a temperature rise associated with the conversion in reactor two. So that is 
automatically implied by the straight line energy balance. If I now should draw my mole balances, this reactor one intersects there, reactor two will intercept over there. So the mole balances will shift. But X is still my overall X that I base this on the inlet conditions. But now, errors in terms of this um, energy balance for reactor two. So please, I am going definitely. You are wonderful at solving for pack bed and BFO reactors, but you suck at CSDRs. Most of you suck at CSDRs. You will see a CSDR in future assessments again. Your assault is a pack bed reactor and a PFR, but you will get a CSDR either in semester test two or in the exam. And you will see a series CSDR system. And I am going to put in heat exchangers and separators and whatnots. I'm going to test you on CSDRs in the future. It is not, this is not behind us. So please pay attention to the following discussion. Right. Uh, okay. So CSDR2, some misconceptions in terms of its energy balance. Once you have really, and that is why I say, first write it in terms of molar flow rates and epsilons over that reactor and then write everything in terms of x okay because the x does not mark the spot and it confused the hell of a lot of out of a lot of people okay right so if i now look at the second reactor i can look at it in isolation you can say right let me just look at that reactor it, I know it comes in at a certain inlet temperature. That is the inlet temperature to that reactor. What mistakes that people made is to calculate an X2. So they calculate an X2 star. Right? They calculate an X2 star, which is the conversion just of incremental conversion just over that reactor. Fine by me. I'm happy. But then you must do your energy balance correctly. Right? So then the temperature one, this is the mistake that people made. So okay, now I'm in the second reactor. So temperature two, sorry, this temperature coming out here is equal to what is the inlet temperature there? Happiness, man, energy released. And then you try to plug stuff into a, a, an equation. If I, um, one must it then be, some people wrote if I naught there, X2 star divided by. And then, said it is equal to whatever comes into that reactor, uh, F, B, U, C, B. What is the error there? Okay, so I can't see your typing now. This is why this is now very irritating. So account for whatever is coming in F, A, whatever is coming F, B, but using the flow rate into that reactor. What did you forget? The F, C, because in that stream, you've got if A, if B, and if C, right? Rather than saying this is equal to if I naught the CPA plus if B naught CPB, where this refers to the energy carrying capacity there that stays constant because my delta CP of the reaction is negligible. Okay, so either you can write this, it's sum of everything that was coming in. CPB, or you can write this, FA1, CPA, FB, so not sum, FB1, CPB, plus FC1, CPC. Right. Okay, so if the uh, del H of the reaction was not zero, this would have been your only option. So in that energy balance, what I would recommend, so this is my recommendation now, so let's check the stroke eraser now, this doesn't work. Um, no, you're fantastic. Okay, so there we go. For the second reactor, the recommended approach is the following. I have an FA1 and I have a temperature 1. And I have an FA2 and I have a temperature max 2. Okay? Energy balance there says temperature max. Okay, well, let's just write the full energy balance. It says whatever comes in must be heated up. And I can... Either now calculate that as everything that would comes into that reactor from temperature um, one to temperature max, 
or as I just explained, you could have equated that to whatever was coming in in the original stream because that energy balance stays the same. Plus, del H of the reaction times epsilon over that reactor. Another error that some people made is to say, I'm going to <laughs> calculate this if I naught times X times del H over del H reaction. And this is the amount of energy that is released to the reaction just in this reaction. Can you see that you then you are unfair because you appropriate some of the energy that was released due to the reaction in this reactor to the second reactor system. So this is the epsilon just over reactor two. Epsilon just over reactor two is equal to F A two minus F A one divided by minus and now you can write it in terms of whichever x's you want. Okay, right. I'm going to step off from this question now. Except that I think the most important thing to get is you are not done with CSTRs. Um, and lots of you are still very confused about the energy balances and the mole balance because you try to write it in terms of x's. We don't need to. We can write it in terms of x's in our code. Right, we can write that in so that you don't make silly mistakes. Okay. Right. Okay. So let's go to question, more questions on this question. All right. So overall, very well, good performance in question one. Okay. Oh, the class average for the semester test was 61%. Yay. Thank you all. Very well done. I'm chuffed. I aim for 65, but I'll settle for 61. So this was me being mean. Question 2A was me being slightly mean this was a, a more difficult question and the performance i expected the performance to be worse so this is the pressure drop in the packed bed reactor and here i said you have a liquid phase reaction so it's liquid phase a liquid phase reaction okay does the urban equation still apply for liquid phase reactions yes what is the only difference this is not a variable, not a variable. This is the fluid density along the length of the reactor. In other words, I am not going to do this. I'm not going to say I've got an ideal gas, so I am going to substitute this in terms of the ideal gas equation. So that Ergen equation that you now work with in all your touch, that's either a DPDZ or a DPDW that says you've got in turbulent flow, you've got a K times a pressure over P naught times a temperature over, oh, sorry, other way around, P naught over pressure, temperature over T naught, FT over FT naught. This comes from the fact that you apply the ideal gas equation to calculate that density. So if you did that, you do not understand the Ergen equation. Please go back. The reason why I gave this question is in the design project last year, students had to size a liquid phase reactor. And, the, and some of them used the ideal gas law in the Ergen equation, and that was very embarrassing for me, okay? Because I had a fellow grader who said, what did you teach the people in this course that you can write the density of a liquid phase with the um, with the ideal gas equation. So please, this then does not apply. I can hear some questions coming through. Is it just comments? No, just comments. Okay. Right. So, in other words, and then I apologize for the fact that I didn't tell you that it's turbulent flow. So many people assumed that it was laminar flow because of the higher viscosity for a liquid. Um, in CIO, how often... Think about how often did you do a problem where you could actually have laminar flow, even when you had a liquid phase. Most problems had a Reynolds number in CIO, most realistic flow systems in industry, have Reynolds numbers in excess of 30,000. Right. So the chances are, yes, this is going to contribute a lot. It may contribute more than in the gas phase. But chances are still good that you can get turbulent flow in um, uh, uh, liquid phase reactions, but that had to be class that had to be given, right? So now, uh, so even if you now assumed laminar flow, please go and check your test. If you assumed laminar flow and you didn't see the announcement that you can assume turbulent flow, I marked with your error, uh, with your way of interpreting that question. So please uh, go and check whether um, that is in fact 
true for your specific test. But now, once again, we could neglect that. So in my Ergen equation, I could have dp dz is equal to. So everything here stays constant. The g, okay, g is a constant that's going to change per design. And I'm going to multiply that. But once again, there's no variable in this equation for liquid phase reactions. So for a liquid phase, this sim simply becomes equal to min k. Okay, that is how that equation is modified. And if I want to write that to be in terms of dw, I know that dz times rho bed area gives me dw. So this will give me uh, the mass based rate constant that I want. So this mass based rate constant is equal to the k that is given by all these variables. Let me just go and clear some stuff up. That is equal to all the variables here, the g squared, function of g squared, the uh, density, the particle diameter, bed porosity, but also then once again divided by the bed density times the area in order to give me that in per kilogram catalyst. Right, so if I now want to analyze this, I want to do this in amount of catalyst per tube in my reactor. So that, if I want to calculate my dp, is equal to min k dash dw zero to dw per tube in my reactor, okay? So since this is not a function of anything that is changing, it's not a function of pressure or temperature, simply my delta P in friction is min K dash times the mass of catalyst per tube in my reactor. Very important error, very co conceptual error. Delta PF, I cannot say that I have a pressure drop per tube. I don't have 50 tubes, and then I have five kilopascals over this one, five over that one, five over that one, and I just add the lot together, and it ends up with 40. Hopefully in CIO, you were clear on the idea that the pressure drop over one is the pressure drop over all. Pressure drop over one over parallel systems is the pressure drop over all. It is this K value that is per kilogram per tube or per total kilogram of the catalyst, depending on how you define it. Please, 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 you are not going to calculate the pressure drop over one tube and then multiply it by the amount of tubes to get your total pressure drop. Right? I've seen it. I've seen it happen. It's an easy mistake, and I've seen people in industry who wants to do that. Okay, so if that you made that misconception, please correct it. Answer, ask me about it. So now what we wanted to see is what is this K proportional to. So if I look at my Ergen equation, I could see that it's directly proportional, just like in the gas phase reaction. It's directly proportional to G squared and uh, inversely proportional. There we go. So directly, there we go. directly proportional to the G squared that I gave in your, um, so in the, from the Ergen equation, but also this area over there. So that area over there, because I need to convert from a per length basis to a per mass catalyst basis. Everything else will stay the same. This G squared is proportional to the mass flow rate per tube divided by the area of a tube squared. And this mass flow rate per tube is directly proportional to my total mass flow rate divided by the number of tubes. So therefore, for the first part, I need to know that my g squared is directly proportional to 1 over the number of tubes squared. Okay? And the area is directly proportional to the diameter squared. So therefore, my g squared is directly proportional to 1 over area, so 1 over the diameter squared squared. Okay. But now I have another area there that I need to account for. So there's an extra d squared below the line to complete the proportionality. So my g squared is actually directly proportional to, or my, sorry, my k, sorry, apologies. My k dash is actually directly proportional to my 1 over the number of tubes that I have squared 
1 over the diameter to the power of 6 because of that and the extra area to make sense of the units um, and therefore this is what you will have to do in order to calculate your new k. If my k in scenario 2 divided by k in scenario 1 is therefore equal to the number of tubes in 1, number of tubes in 2 squared and d in scenario 1 to the power of 6 divided by d in scenario 2 to the power of 6. This I could calculate from my given information. It was 40 kilopascals. This is the mass of catalyst that I had in my tube. So I could calculate my K for scenario 1 from the given uh, scenario that you had. You had to calculate the number mass of catalyst per tube, which is equal to your total mass. Oops, there we go. Total mass divided by the number of tubes. So I could, I knew what my K1 was. I knew K1. And so you were given conditions, changing conditions, so you could calculate your K2. Many people neglected this effect of the number of tubes on the mass flow rate through the tube. Right, so now I am not done yet. All this for five marks. Yes. No? So now I'm not done yet. I want to say right now I want to calculate the PDW per tube. And that is equal to min K2 now. Min K2 dash. So now I have my min K2 dash. So if I want to calculate my frictional pressure loss, it's going to zero to W per tube K dash D W. This is also going to change. The mass of catalyst per tube is also going to change because it is the total amount, the 800 kilograms, divided by your number of tubes. And so therefore, in order to complete my problem, I had to realize delta P is equal to negative, sorry, negative K dash 2 times W per tube in scenario 2. So this also changed. This is a hectic question for only five marks. I realized I could have made this count 15 marks, but then my class average wouldn't have been 61%. And I anticipated that. So if you've got full marks for this question, please give yourself a shout, shout out. Um, make sure that you understand um, how duration worked. Okay. Right, questions. Did I, I, I heard some comments. I can hear the ping, ping, pings coming on, and I can just see you all smiling. I'm going to laugh at them later. Okay, there we go. I can still see them, so you can still cannot be rude. I can check them out afterwards. Okay, so in the last question, sorry, this is a very long recording. Uh, I hope you can watch it in sections. This, yes, question. I'm going to ask, what does it mean if we neglected the M per tube? I assume the mass per tube. Sorry, I didn't hear that part. If I neglect the what? The mass per tube. What if you neglect the mass per tube? The mass tube? flow rate. So I think oh, it's okay. So, so the error, the error that you made. Okay, so if if I now look at the proration, so I have two masses. Let's not get, not get confused by this. I have two masses when I now talk about mass. I have my mass flow rate, which is the kilograms per second, the total mass flow rate. So the total mass flow rate to my reactor didn't change. That stayed the same. Okay? But because I had more tubes or less tubes, the mass flow rate divided by the number of tubes, which gives me that G value that I had to use to calculate the G, that changed because I changed the number of tubes. And some people forgot about that. They only changed the K by considering correctly this change in the diameter. And they did not consider the fact that the number of tubes changed the flow rate in in the tubes. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay. And this was me at my meanest. Question three was really the meanest of this uh, whole paper. But I'm being kind by challenging you to think critically. I once had a student uh, who said, ma'am, your tests or your questions are always, you've got three questions, doable, difficult, and completely undoable. 
Right. So, um, and I think I haven't changed my strategy since. So, if you've got full marks for this question, um, well done. You will always, it's not intended to be undoable, but this is intended for somebody who wants to get a distinction for this um, uh, oh, subject. So, if I now analyze, I asked you to do a Levenspiel plot just by looking at the information given here. So the Levenspiel plot is all about the rates. Let me first show you how it does not look. This is the most common mistake that I uh, observed. So let's say this is 30%. First thing you should have noticed is here when there's kind of an asymptote forming. There, the, my volume specifically for the CSTR and also for the PFR just kind of shoots up an increase in volume is a, a symptom of a sudden increase in the rut. So first thing I wanted you to realize is there is an equilibrium limitation there at about 30%. So I wanted you to tell me not only the shape, but explain the shape. So you had to tell me that this is an equilibrium reaction. That is the one thing I was looking for. This is an equilibrium reaction because the rate seems to go to pretty much zero when X went approached 30%. And whatever value you add here, you could say, what it, 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 but approaching an equilibrium conversion. That is what I wanted to see. Okay. Then, so what I'm going to show you now, if you were asleep, if I lulled you into sleep, is the incorrect answer for the shot. People did this. They said many answers look like this. Right? To say the right first goes to a maximum and then it goes up. So let's see why this is wrong. If you analyze these first few volumes, let's just focus on them. If I analyze these, for, the, for a given conversion, I get exactly the same volume for a CSTR and a plug flow reactor. For a CSTR, that is this volume there, CSTR, for up to that X. For a plug flow reactor, it's that area. They are not equal at all, and they cannot be if there's a little dip in the right. They cannot be. The only way that those areas can be equal, only way, is if it looked like that. Because for that part, then this area, the blue area, which is below the line, and the jump to the final conversion, which will always give me a block, must both be blocks. So therefore, my plug flow reactor must also give me a block. So for that first part, therefore, for that first part, up to up to 15%, or where the volumes are equal, it must be a block. So that must be that initial shape of my right. No change in the right. And then suddenly it went reduced because the volumes really started to um, increase substantially, okay? not linearly. There it increased linearly with the, um, with the conversion and until it went to that asymptote. This is the shape I was looking for, not this. But did you realize that that right stays constant? So for the shape, you got marks. But I wanted the following. Is this an endo or an exothermic reaction? And it is equilibrium bound. It's equilibrium bound. I had some people telling me that this is an endothermic reaction because of this decrease in the rate. No increase in the rate was observed. So therefore, they said, I didn't see that. So they had this drawing correct. Jing. I didn't see that, but so therefore it must be an endothermic reaction. Why is that incorrect? If it was an endothermic reaction, and I had a KC, um, K over KC, CD. If I had an endothermic reaction, right, so this is my RA, sorry, RA equal. Endothermic reaction, this would go down. This would go down, right? This, okay, the, this right will just increase. And this will increase. Okay, this will go down, but not as much as that one. So for an endothermic reaction, there's no way that I will be able to keep the right constant because there's nothing fighting this drop in concentration of my reactant. 
Okay. For an exothermic reaction, how can this shape look like this? How can I get a constant rate? It is because the fight between the temperature effect on K and the concentration effect on CA is exactly the same. So they fight each other and there's no winner until that temperature effect and the fact that I'm building that starts to um, take over, the reverse reaction starts to take over. Right, so that is what I wanted in this explanation and I realize it is a very difficult question. It is intended to be a difficult question. Right, so um, if you got this question correct, um, well done. Right, can I have questions on this? I hear a comment, is there a question or a comment? Comment. Okay, so let me just see where am I now, Jink? Okay, so um, I'm going to stop the recording.